we have with us today to talk about, as we go forward from this event, about the future, what is next for data center efficiency, energy efficiency, two leading experts, two folks who were early, two folks who are still very deeply committed to this topic, two experts who have graced this stage uh, at various venues over the seven years of symposium. First, of course, the man needs no introduction, Ken Brill, founder of Uptime. Ken has kindly come back from Asia, where he has been traveling almost nonstop for two years, uh, establishing Uptime in countries far and wide. Ken is joined by a current and former collaborator on papers, topics, and, and, and ideas within Uptime, uh, Jonathan Toomey, noted author, currently a uh, consulting professor at Stanford. Uh, gentlemen, we're delighted to have you here. I know we could go long, so I won't take any more of the precious time. Please, the question before us is, what's next for data center energy efficiency? Ken Brill, Jonathan Coomey. So thanks very much, Martin. Uh, at one of the data center charrettes that Uptime put on several years ago, I was the uh, moderator for that, uh, the host of it, I guess you would say. And I got to wear my hat because it was in Santa Fe. And at the time, it was only me and Dr. Bob who were wearing <laughs> hats. But now Ken has found the greater hat, as you've all seen. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's next. But in order to set the stage for that, I want to talk very briefly about where we've been. Back in 2006 or so, people started worrying about the growth in the electricity use of data centers. And you started to see some real attention being paid by the Environmental Protection Agency, the Energy Star Group. You started to see the server manufacturers focusing on making their uh, servers more energy proportional so that as computing load grows, the energy use grows. But if you're not doing much on your server, the energy use would go closer to zero. Uh, there's been a great deal of progress in that area. Uh, over the last five or six years. People have certainly made great progress on the infrastructure efficiency of data centers. So that was really the first time people were worrying about this problem. And what we'll see in the, in the talk that uh, we'll give right now is that this problem, although data centers are a highly technical area, the problems that impede efficiency in the data center are much more about people and institutions than they are about technology. So to achieve big savings, the primary thing we need is management buy-in. We need C-level folks to be focused on total costs and changing the incentive structures and management structures so that uh, people are looking at the total costs and making decisions about the data center based on the total costs. We know that using existing technology, we can get uh, total energy savings of uh, greater than 50%. We know that by focusing on aligning authority uh, and accountability, we can actually uh, make those savings uh, good for the profits of the organization as well as good for the environment. Uh, what we need to do, of course, is break down the silos and make sure that IT and facilities and real estate are all in the room when decisions are being made and that they're all uh, operating off of a common playbook, uh, total costs, minimizing, minimizing total costs. So in order to make this kind of change successful, you need to have deep technical knowledge. This is not a simple thing to do, as everyone in this room knows well. And you need to have a long-term perspective. You can't just make uh, quick changes and expect there to be uh, big results and big savings. Now, the people who have done this well are well on the path to uh, reducing their total cost, significantly reducing their energy use. The people who have not yet done it well are going to see increasing pressure from other ways of delivering information technology services. So that means competition from cloud providers, competition from uh, the, some of the more advanced uh, folks who are uh, designing data centers collaboratively with their customers and uh, getting very low PUEs, very low uh, capital costs compared to standard in-house facilities. When I talk about in-house facilities, I mean companies whose main business is not 
computing. So there will be increasing pressure because the economics of these, uh, these cloud-based and other solutions are actually quite compelling. And you're starting to see, in many instances, certain kinds of uh, IT loads being shifted to the cloud and to other innovative uh, data centers of this type. And you've heard about that in earlier sessions. So with that, I will turn it over to Ken. You know, one of the problems that we have is that we all talk about data centers, but all data centers are not the same. Uh, we should talk about data centers and their mission. I've come up with, I think there are three types of computing. Uh, they, all have, they all occur in data centers, but they each have their own unique OPEX, CAPEX, and reliability requirement. Historically, the first one was scientific computing. This goes back to, to the Second World War. It has to do with trying to calculate the trajectory of a, of a gun to hit a target some distance away. And it was also to, related to trying to break codes. I call that scientific. Uh, today, we would call that modeling. That's a unique type of computing. It has its own OPEX, CAPEX, uh, it's unique in the sense that you can rerun the data and you'll get the same result. Uh, it's fundamentally different than some other things. Sometime in the 60s, we started to do business data processing and, we, and that was in addition to the scientific. So each of these trends adds and the business computing we still do today. And we have a new kind of computing that's come in, which is called, I, I for back of a letter bird, a, a better word, called consumer computing. And this is all the stuff that's done uh, on the internet. Now, some of that's business, obviously, but the whole Facebook phenomenon, the whole apps that we have on our phones are consumer computing. They're not business computing, but it all goes through data centers. Each of these have a different combination of OPEX, CAPEX that they need to have. And it would help us if we talked about which type of computing we're talking about. It would eliminate a lot of uh, um, heat in some of our discussions. Now, I want to talk about the rear end of the dog versus the front end of the dog. I think we have primarily focused on the rear end of the dog. And we have, uh, for some data center applications, the OPEX, you know, the PUE of, of, of a neighborhood of 1.2 has been achieved. Uh, not every data center can use that, however, and not every environment can do that. But for those who, that is, an, that, that is their primary cost driver, we have answered that question. Uh, it's not clear to me that the answers that work for consumer compute and scientific compute also work for business compute. That, that we, we haven't seen, there, there's still a lot of disagreement about that. Now, we have improved our CapEx, but we haven't solved the CapEx problem. As soon as, as if you're still re in, installing refrigeration, we have not solved the CapEx problem. Now, there are some people who aren't putting in any refrigeration at all, and that is beginning to address the CapEx. The only other way we're addressing the CapEx is the modular uh, factory built things. Uh, but fundamentally, the CapEx hasn't improved nearly as much as the OpEx. Now, I want to use an example of a uh, front end of the dog. And I would venture that if we put as much effort into the front end of the dog as the back end of the dog, we would see much bigger results in reducing energy consumption. Now, the reason I'm wearing this hat is not because I love this hat, but because I'm trying to make a point. Does everybody know what this was about? Not everybody was part of this. This is a game that, that the, the team came up with, and we challenged uh, the, the end users to see how many servers that they could turn off. Now, back in 2006, we postulated uh, that it was that we, we came up with the word comatose servers, and we postulated that there might be 10 or 15 percent of comatose servers. 
Now, comatose servers are ones that are dead. They're ones that are no longer doing anything, but they're still plugged in because nobody knows what they are and nobody's willing to unplug them. Now, how could that possibly be? Well, if you turn over 30, per, uh, uh, 30 year servers of every year and 15% of the servers for one reason or another don't get removed, after four or five years, you've got a significant number of servers that are still installed. Now, we postulate, do anybody remember when I got up and I wore the, the blue wizard hat? My kids remember. <laughs> um, so that was the first time I wore a hat. And I proposed the idea, could we go home from symposium and find out how many comatose servers we had? Well, some people did. And uh, I'll show that on the next slide. Now, what I've written here and what you see on the background are my estimates, not the Institute's estimates, but my estimates. And we'll clean these up and publish them as uh, the, the Institute. These are my estimates of what the, turning off 20,000 servers means. At 20,000 servers is 6,000 kW. That's a big data center. That's a huge data center. If we were to go to build that data center, we would spend approximately $120 million. Uh, we've talked in the past about the NNDC. Remember that? The no new data center strategy? Turning off what we don't need is the, is the greenest solution you could possibly have. Then in addition to your CapEx, you know, the OpEx, $10 million. This is per year in electricity saved because you don't have these servers running. And then there's licensure savings. And in some cases, there will be maintenance savings, all from turning off 20,000 servers. Now, let's look at this next. Now, the AOL people said that they, the, the savings, they, they were the high dog at 2,300. And they turned off, uh, I mean, 9,300. And uh, they turned off 26%. Now that, I was a little upset with that because I said, yeah, there, there, there's, there's some more, I suspect. And when I talked with them, they said, yes, we think there are about 2,500 more. And that falls in line with everybody else that has been willing. No, typically, I admire the AOL people for being honest about this. Pip, when you find out how much stuff is running, it, it's just like the kids leaving the house for the weekend and leaving the lights on. Literally, this is what we're talking about. This is stuff that is not doing, this isn't like you're, you're going to um, uh, virtualize it or you're going to uh, consolidate it. This is stuff that is doing literally nothing except taking up power and cooling in space. Now, we have network members that off the record, without attribution, come in with numbers consistently 30% and higher. Now, there were six firms that contributed to the server roundup, and they got these big numbers. Now, what would happen if 100 firms did this? Or, and John, what did you figure out in the world, John? So IDC uh, data for 2010 shows the installed base of servers around 32 million or so. So if you're talking about a third of those servers, we're talking about 9 or 10 million servers. That's, those are big numbers. That would be a anybody. big impact on the world. So I, I want to share with you some other data because we've all heard about how utilization uh, is, is, you know, you hear numbers 10%, 20%, 40%, whatnot. I've been suspicious of that. And because what we've been looking at is the output of a UPS. If, if the utilization is as higher as some people say it is, the output of the UPS ought to go up and down during the course of the day. Now, obviously, some places that does occur, but very, it's very unusual. And we presented information on this in previous uh, uh, symposiums, and it's absolutely flat, maybe a 1% variation. 
So this is the first data that I've actually gotten as to actual utilization. And maybe in the future, we'll have additional data. And this is it. What we see here is uh, the server population, 54% of the, of the uh, population is, had a utilization of less than 0.6%. That's comatose. The only thing going on here is network updates and backup and disaster recovery and whatnot. The, another 24% of the population had a utilization, average utilization of 4.8%. 22% had a utilization of 27.8%. Well, we might have some numbers like this, but let's look at the next slide. And this is the peak utilization. So the, the servers that were most utilized, the peak utilization was still only 43%, and that was only for 6.1 hours a day. Clearly, these servers are not working most of the day. And then when we, you can see what it needs for major improvement, this is terrible. If we, if we built a manufacturing plant and had this kind of utilization, we would be fired. No doubt about it. Let's look further. Minimum utilization, it's the, it, at least in the, in the not great, it's, it's better than, than it would, you, you would think. But in the other cases, it's just not great. Now, here's the catcher. Let's look at the power. Power didn't change. Now, at least on this middle category and on the comatose, why can't we turn on the power saving feature? Why do we make, I mean, we've been talking about this for years, but we still don't use the power saving feature, which is why the UPS energy consumption is flat. So what should ID do to today? Number one, go out and kill those comatose servers. Next year, we're going to do the, the server thing again, the roundup again. I hope we get 100,000 or 200,000. Those, it's out there. If you're building a new data center and you're trying to figure out how big a one to build, the first thing you need to do is get rid of those comatose servers so you don't size in what's already obsolete. And then, of course, you need to consolidate and virtualize. And the, and the next one, it, it, this is practically free. It, Buy more energy efficient power supplies. All the people that we have heard here today, that, that it, or I mean this week, that have cut their energy consumption significantly, the first thing they do is buy more energy efficient power supplies. That by itself will reduce by the energy consumption by 20%, and then it reduces the, the need to cool it and the need to power it. So it's, it's like, and, and the, the incremental cost for this, particularly if all of us would demand it and get the cost down, the, the parts cost to do this is under 2 or $3 and a 20% savings. And then why don't we use these, the, why don't we turn these power saving features on? So that, particularly in test, and, test area, and development area, why don't we, since that inherently is a, is a workload that's not active, why not, in that area at least, turn on the power saving feature so it's not used, the energy consumption goes down. So one example, uh, Winston Saunders of Intel told me recently that they have new servers now that at idle will use 20% of their maximum power use. So almost they've almost solved this problem of energy proportional computing, but if you turn off the power saving features, obviously you don't get anywhere near that good get performance. So. What we see as digital infrastructure convergence, IT and facilities are going to come together. The CIO is going to increasingly be measured on his budget. And I don't see any pressures that are going to give him more money. And so the, this, this convergence, IT and facilities the, those companies that have put that together, and it, the, the, this message is becoming really clear, for large institutions with a global presence putting IT facilities in the same 
area. You heard it when what Google's been up here, Facebook's been up here, others of our members have been. It's hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars over a five-year period. That is the magnitude of savings that can occur when you get the, the, the two groups joined together and you optimize around business mission. In the future, digital infrastructure conversion means that IT and facilities are going to have to come up with the most optimal OPEX and CAPEX money using a combination of in-source for some stuff, outsource for some stuff, third party, managed services, all these different things. And if we think it's difficult now, it's only going to get worse. And those who do not embrace this are going to be swept away. It's as simple as that. The money is too big to not pay attention. Is that noise or is that opportunity? I would suggest it's opportunity. So with that, we have some questions. We have about eight minutes left, so we have time for a few questions. Please. If you'll wait for the, the mic, microphone. The mic is coming. Ken, that's a good insight that there are three types of compute. Uh, so, you know, the nature of the transaction itself, uh, you know, when you batch scientific uh, co computation and, you know, feed it, force feed it, you can have a high utilization rate perhaps. But mm -hmm. when you have internet-based, you know, one-off and back and forth, uh, by its very nature, it's not going to have a high uh, CPU utilization. Mm -hmm. So there are certain things we have to acknowledge as just the way they're going to be. And the other part of this is, you know, we've spent, in my career, 40 years, 30 years learning how to be reliable. And I think that we're in the process of unlearning some of the lessons that we've learned. If we want high reliability, it doesn't mean that it's going to be necessarily energy efficient. So one more point on that, uh, Luis Barroso at Google published a number of years ago a nice distribution of their utilization, and the average was around 30-ish percent. So for certain kinds of applications, obviously you need that additional headroom, right? But for many applications, they're running well below 10 percent, and that's really the, the place where the big opportunities are. We have one big study that I can't talk about yet, but I hope they will release the data. The, 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 we're beginning to get the true story, but I believe that utilization is single digits, and I think in some cases across many servers is, less, is in the 1% to 2% area. Right, and that is the critical point at which you can vastly reduce the cost per computation. So if you can double utilization, your cost of computation per computation, of course, goes down by a factor of two. And there's, there's at least you know, three or four times improvement in utilization that we can see in these servers that are uh, sitting around mostly doing nothing. Yes, sir, in the back. Hi, uh, I'm Carsten Baumann with Schneider Electric. I think you made a really great point about the comatose servers. But I mean, it doesn't seem to be like a new concept of <laughs> no, not it's doing not. it. <laughs> what I'm hearing you saying is we as the industry, we're not doing it. So why is that? Like, we, listen, all the people that talked about it, we've heard here, that have talked about transformational change, IT and facilities were in the same boat, and there was a, there was a deep understanding of the, of the opportunity to redu reduce OPEX and CAPEX. That seems to be the gating factor. Some people will see those opportunities clearly, but that out of the universe of, pop, of, of opportunity, that maybe represents maybe what, 5%, 10%? 80% or 90% of the market doesn't see that yet. Yeah, so this, I would add to that that uh, 
this is really a management problem. Until you fix the management problem of misplaced incentives, separate budgets for IT and facilities, no common language for costs and components of costs, no simple model that everyone can agree on when they're arguing about what the cost implications are for the company, you are going to end up with massively suboptimal results. And so this really technological industry that we're in is afflicted by a management problem that's older than the data center industry. And there are ways to fix it. And the way we need to fix it is at the sea level, they need to fix the incentives and the responsibilities. This one? Okay, so just a follow up question. So that means it's ignorance on the, let's call it the CFO kind of level, right? Or is the problem for the CFO just simply not big enough to tackle it? When data centers cost $500 million to build, it's big enough. I, I think it's, it's just the, there is an ignorance of the size of the opportunity. Right. The, the, the AOL people were good enough to share. Uh, that's part of our guide process is people share why they won the award. They took three runs at it in order to do those savings. The first two, they didn't have support. And then the third time, they, they, got, they got support from senior people, and that's what it took. Because anytime you're going to do efficiency things, you are going to gore somebody's cow. That is the nature of, of you're going to upset somebody. So you need to have sponsorship at a very high level to push through the bureaucratic resistance. Until you get that, 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 that is not something you can do from the bottom up. It's something that must come from the top down. And this is, this is not a new lesson. So back in the late 80s, there was a program called Green Lights. It was started by John Hoffman at EPA. It was the predecessor to Energy Star. And what they did was they got commitments from CEOs of major companies to retrofit their lighting. Because the efficiency opportunity for lighting was huge. Simple paybacks of one year one and a half years. So they got a letter from the CEO saying, we promise to retrofit our facilities up to a three-year payback. And they were able to use that commitment from the CEO to break through the institutional logjam. And any, the, the enthusiasts who wanted to do something about efficiency, they could wave this letter around and say, the boss wants it. Get out of my way. And so having this CEO level or C-level C buy-in is really critical to changing institutional behavior inside big organizations. And in fairness, I, I noticed that you were Schneider and Electric. This is not a Schneider, this is not a vendor problem. The vendors, I think, have really done, they've done their part. It's the users now that have got to step up. And my message to the users is if you don't do this, there are others who will. And your job is probably going to disappear. This is, this is, this is transformational. If, if these costs don't get covered or brought down, the, the, our economy will assure over time that some people go out of business. There's a man with a hat right there. Uh, Bob Sullivan. And first of all, I'd like to make a comment about previous discussion. I don't think it is, we put the blame on the chief financial officer. My experience is, it's ignorance and arrogance by the CIO that leaves uh, comatose servers in place until he runs out of room, he runs out of that's, power, that's right. and then all of a sudden he gets religion because he can't, his well, job is system availability and application rollout, and that's all he cares about. And he doesn't care about anything else. He doesn't care about efficiency until he doesn't have space or he doesn't have power to do the two previous things. That's right. So that's, that's my comment on that. Now, I have two questions. One is, this is a wild uh, projection, but I'd like you to comment on it. And that is, with more efficient hardware and uh, <coughs> the uh, you know, innovation and uh, consolidation of servers that a, there should never be another data center that runs out of space or power. Second uh, thing I'd like you to comment on is what do we do with all the data? What about the storage? Yeah. Right. 
The, 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 new, the new thing I suspect in another year or two is we're going to be doing the same thing over the, de the, the storage growth. One of, the, one of our members was talking that their storage used to be 10% of their energy consumption in the data center. It's now 30%. And what are we going to do with all of the data that is stored but is never used? So that will, yeah, my prediction is that, that that's a, you know, about the time we get this one to, uh, maybe brought to consciousness, that'll be the new one. And the same institutional fixes that we talk about, of course, will promote efficiency in that area as well. There's plenty of things you could do by sorting things by latency and other clever technological tricks. Okay, we're up. We're up. up. We're out of we're time. We're out of time. So thanks to everyone. So thank for you your very time. much.